Hi, I'm Eric Oberg. I'm a ranger at the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, part of the National Park Service System in the United States of America. The Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area is the largest urban park in the country, located just west of Los Angeles, California. I'm also the leader of the Biodiversity Project, a community science initiative where we engage students and volunteers to help us document insect biodiversity here in the park. Insects play an incredibly important role in any park or protected ecosystem, performing functions like pollination, soil nutrient cycling, and providing valuable food sources for many other species of animals. Our project is similar to the kind of work um, that was accomplished by a small group of scientists all the way on the other side of the earth uh, in Australia um, where they were studying phasmids. Australia and the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area both have Mediterranean climates. So they actually have many um, plants and animals that are similar. Today, with Reading with the Ranger, I'll be reading Phasmid, Saving the Lord Howe Island Stick Insect by Rohan Cleave and Coral Tillich, with publishing permission by CSIRO Publishing. Phasmid, Saving the Lord Howe Island Stick Insect. All right, here we go. Sometimes a story of animal survival in the wild is so unbelievable that you could not possibly think it was true. This is one such story of how a few dedicated people rediscovered a lost species and others are working to save it from extinction. Welcome to my home, Lord Howe Island. My beautiful island is an extinct volcano that formed about seven million years ago. It is located in the Tasman Sea, 600 kilometers, or about 372 miles, east of the Australian mainland. Lord Howe Island is also known as the Last Paradise. The world has recognized the island's beauty and biodiversity and has promised to protect it for future generations. Ball's Pyramid is a smaller island that lies about 23 kilometers, or about 14 miles, southeast of Lord Howe Island. It's the tallest volcanic stack in the world, rising 551 meters, or uh, just over 1,800 feet, above sea level. My life begins inside a small egg. It is a funny looking egg with a round cap at one end, but this is no ordinary little egg. My mother can bury my egg underground. She carefully covers my egg with dirt to keep me safe and warm. I am not the only egg my mother will lay she can lay up to 300 eggs in her lifetime. I grow inside my little egg for at least six months, and I may keep growing for up to nine months. I grow until I am three times longer than my egg. My egg is about six millimeters, or about 15 64ths of an inch, long. But when I am ready to hatch, my body is about two centimeters, or almost three quarters of an inch long. How do I fit inside my tiny egg? I am very soft and carefully folded like a paper clip. There is no more room left inside my egg now. Early one morning, the cap on my egg pops open. It's time to break free, but it is a hard struggle. I use my head to help push the cap open so I can escape. I push up and up through the dirt until at last I see the morning sky. It is very tiring for me to get out of my egg and I have to rest often. I use my legs and abdomen to pull and pry my way out. I am bright green and I have six legs. I have two very long antennae on my head. 
I climb the nearest bush as fast as I can. It is hard to see me resting here. Camouflage is my best chance for surviving in the wild. I must hide from predators like birds. They see me as their next meal. I should be safe hiding among the green leaves. Over many months, I begin to change how I look and behave. I do not have a backbone, but have an exoskeleton on the outside of my body. I must molt my old exoskeleton and grow a new one up to nine times before I become an adult. When I am young, I am green and I rest in the sunlight during the day. As I grow, my color changes to mottled green and brown, then brown, then finally to black. I now like to hide during the day and am fully nocturnal. I huddle tightly with other animals like me in a big ball inside dark log hollows. I reach adulthood when I'm about six months old. It's only safe to venture out at night to feed and explore. I must be careful of predators like the owls who would like to eat me. I climb around the branches and feed on my favorite melaleuca and banyan leaves. One night, I climb down to the ground and catch my reflection in a puddle of water. I am the Lord Howe Island Phasmid. We were once found all over the lowland areas of Lord Howe Island, but now not many of us are left alive. Until very recently, people thought we were extinct, lost forever. One accident changed our way of life. Nearly 100 years ago, a ship ran aground on the jagged coral reef around the island. The black rats on board the ship escaped. With empty stomachs, the hungry rats ate all the phasmids on Lord Howe Island in a very short time. Luckily, some of us found our way to Ball's Pyramid, a huge rock surrounded by pounding ocean waves. Nobody really knows how we got there. Were we carried there by local fishermen or seabirds? Did we drift across the ocean? Or maybe some of our ancestors had arrived long ago? Ball's Pyramid is a harsh and dangerous place, but it was our only home for a very long time. Clinging to the steep side of a cliff face Somehow, we survived. Over many years, we became lost and forgotten to the rest of the world. Then one day, some scientists set off on an adventure to find us. One dark night, they climbed dangerously high to examine a bush. Suddenly, we appeared in the beam of their torchlight under a beautiful star-filled night sky. The scientists knew that we needed help. Years later, they gently collected some of us to make sure that we were protected. We were beginning an exciting adventure to help save our species. We were on the very edge of extinction, about to vanish forever. But how could humans save our species when nobody knew anything about us? A handful of dedicated people cared for us. They found out what we ate and how we lived, and we began to breed. After many months, the first phasmid to be born in captivity eventually hatched from its egg. Many secrets about our lives still remain to be discovered. We are one of the rarest invertebrates in the world today. Less than 30 of us live in the wild on Ball's Pyramid. One day, we hope to return to Lord Howe Island, our beautiful home. We have survived because a few dedicated people cared enough to want to save us. They wanted to help rescue one of the world's most critically endangered species. All it took was for one little egg to hatch. The end. One of the most important things 
about managing and protecting all of the plants and the animals in a national park is first of all making sure we know what actually lives in the park. There are thousands of insect species that live here in Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. But the truth is, we haven't even discovered all of them yet. Part of the work of National Park Service staff and community science volunteers is helping park rangers to study the insects that live in the park so that we can understand the roles those insects play to learn how we can best protect them. The Biodiversity Project at Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area is a biological survey of insects. And the volunteers that you're gonna to see today are learning different techniques that we use to collect insects, which allows us to study them, identify them, and understand the roles that they play in nature. This technique is called pitfall trapping. This is a small cup that's buried at ground level and then covered to protect it from above. Pitfall traps allow uh, insects that are traveling on the ground to fall into the cup where we can then catch and preserve them. Another insect collection technique is called beet sheeting. There's all sorts of insects that are clinging to the branches and leaves of bushes and small trees. But they're amazingly well camouflaged, which means it's really hard to just look for them and collect them by hand. By using this beet sheet technique, we simply use a piece of fabric and a stick to knock insects from the branches and leaves onto the piece of fabric where we can see them and collect them. Hand netting is probably one of the most easily recognizable and simple methods for collecting insects. It's basically a butterfly net, but this hand collecting technique allows us to do something really important. It combines our ability to observe insects, especially those that are pollinating plants while they're flowering, and then collect and document them. Documenting these pollinator associations is critically important to understanding which insects are pollinating which plants. Another technique community science volunteers are helping rangers with is called litter sampling. The earth has a thin layer of organic soil on the very surface of the ground. This is some of the most important soil for all sorts of ecological reasons. That thin layer of organic soil is where almost all the nutrients are that are available to plants. And it's also where literally thousands of different invertebrate and insect species live. They perform a very important ecosystem service, nutrient cycling. Many, many different types of insects and invertebrates are basically chomping and chewing on uh, organic material like leaves and sticks and twigs and converting it into the soil and nutrients that plants need to survive and grow. But very little is understood about the insects that live in the soil. Litter sampling is a method where we collect a small sample of leaves and litter and this organic soil and then we put it in a burlazy funnel which is basically a five gallon bucket with a light bulb. The light bulb on top makes the insects in the litter sample go to the bottom of the bucket where we collect them and study them. Thank you for joining Reading with the Ranger.